cloud gaming, or the answer to the question, what will you get if you combine the experience of gaming with watching YouTube videos over your grandmother's dial-up connection? Uh, in today's video, I'm gonna have a closer look at this industry more than a year after the death of Stadia. In the face of Google's failure, did anyone succeed? When I decided to make this video, I didn't realize the sheer amount of cloud gaming services that exist at the moment. I thought there was just gonna be like a couple survivors left fighting over scraps in a Denny's parking lot. But no, there's a medium sized swarm of them, all with their own niches, game libraries, and pricing. Pricing is something I really wanna talk about because they range from expensive to obscene. First, I'm gonna look at GeForce Now's pricing, a service I've looked at on the channel before, and it's pretty cool that it comes with a free tier, but that is limited to one hour session lengths and ads. But you know what they say, nothing makes gaming better than some ads. However, you can go all the way up to the ultimate tier for those people that have a 4K high refresh rate monitor, but not a system to drive it for some reason. Uh, so this rig for about 26 Canadian dollars a month comes with a 4080 and no ads. Mm. It then took me ages to figure out how much money you have to give Microsoft for them to let you do some cloud gaming. But after digging through an absurd amount of sub menus, I got to this. Now after ages of searching, from what I can tell, this $19 a month tier gets you cloud gaming along with all of the other Xbox Game Pass features. Uh, but this is still in beta, so I don't know if I'm gonna be able to try this today. Sony, not to be outdone, has their own one with PlayStation Plus Premium Ultra Premium Plus Ultimate, or whatever they call it, which I kinda like the idea of because it's a way for you to get access to exclusive PlayStation games without buying a PlayStation. But to get access to a PS5 on the cloud costs $22 a month which is a lot. But I think for that price, you get games included, which a lot of the others don't. Maybe, I think it does. This stuff is quite convoluted, and I think it's convoluted for a reason so that you end up spending more than you need to. But it's difficult to know what you're getting for your money with a lot of this stuff. Now, if you wanna spend way more money, there is Shadow. Now, in all fairness to Shadow, it is way more flexible than something like GeForce Now. It's not just a game instance running in an app. You get a full virtual desktop. As far as I can tell, they're like an enterprise cloud computing service that now also offers gaming PCs. But anyway, th their pricing is quite misleading as well. Here, it may seem like it's on sale from $40 and costs $10 a month now. But no, that's just the first month that costs $10. It actually costs $40 a month for a system with a 1080 in it. But that isn't the full price either. If you click order, you'll see that for your 40 Canadian dollars a month, that doesn't include any storage. So you need to add a minimum of 256 gigs, which is another $4 a month. And if you want something more powerful, it's more than $60 a month. Maximum settings is another similar option, which gives you cheaper options. You know, there is a $10 a month one, uh, but that's got an RX 580 in it and an AMD 1400, but it has limited hours. Depending on when you're playing, you can just get two hours a day to play and playing any more than that costs you an extra 35 cents per hour. And it's 35 cents per hour for the cheapest package. That price scales up with the higher end packages. So if you go up to the big boy system with the 7900 XTX in it for $30 a month, it costs you an extra $1.25 an hour outside of what you've been allocated. Amazon Luna still exists because apparently Bezos forgot to turn the service off. Uh, I think it's included with Prime, but you have to pay for all the games in it, which I don't think carries over to like Steam or anything, so that's fun. And you can tell they're in bed with good publishers when the main publisher they advertise is Ubisoft. Ugh. Boosteroid is another option which seems to be geared towards the EU market. You can get it in the US, but even the pricing is in Euro, but this 750 euro a month is the only pricing I can find. So that could just be powered by a couple of hamsters in a running wheel. And then the final one pricing wise I'm gonna look at is this Ant stream, which is like a retro game streaming one, which makes the least sense of all of these to me because you can play retro games on a thermostat. Surely the point of cloud gaming is giving you access to really beefy hardware, but maybe not everybody knows about the E word and they're kind of banking on that. The point is, there are a lot of services, all of which have different game libraries. 
So if you really heavily invest in game streaming, you could end up in the same situation that anybody that watches TV now is in, where you have to rent several of these services a month just to get to play all the games you want to play. And I would rather eat my own eyelids than have another bunch of companies try and bleed me dry every month like I'm the world's most succulent leech host. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that is super fun. So with that, let's try out some of these services. I even bought a dedicated bit of game streaming hardware, which seems like a really stupid stupid idea, but let's check it out. The hardware in question is this Logitech Cloud, which may look like a Steam Deck competitor, but it's more a six-year-old mid-range tablet with some Joy-Cons spliced to it, which I guess would be fine if it didn't have the same MSRP as an OLED Nintendo Switch, you know, a real console. It even costs more than an Xbox Series S. That's a brave amount for a device that's performance is directly dependent on how close you live to Jensen's house. Okay, so ergonomically, it's a little bit better than a Switch because it's got like these contoured pads on the base. Build quality wise, it's pretty good as you'd hope for the price. Ooh, you can immediately tell that it doesn't have an OLED in it. This is a 1080p 7-inch IPS display, uh, but I guess we're gonna have to do some game streaming on it before we can really tell what it's like. So you can go between like a tablet UI or a console UI, so we're gonna do that because we're testing its game capability. Now I wanted to start off with GeForce Now because I already had an account, but getting it set up on this device was hugely frustrating. It kept hanging on pages and crashing several times which mixed with the weird keyboard ergonomics made for a frustrating start. Okay, so we, we've finally gotten it working. Oh no, I can't really see where I'm driving. It's okay. There, there is a bit of a delay between like inputs and things happening. But for a game like this, it just makes the car feel heavier. Because it's running at 1080p and the screen is so small, it looks real sharp and detailed. When you do look closer, you start to see compression artifacts and stuff. But because of the size of the display, unless you really get your face in there, you don't really notice that low YouTube video bitrate vibe to the image too much. Moving over to Cyberpunk, again, the input lag is kind of noticeable. There is that heaviness to the inputs, which makes it feel a bit like you're swimming in ketchup. But I don't think Cyberpunk makes sense for this form factor, because the environments are quite busy and you have to see enemies at like a distance and stuff. I don't know if I'd play Cyberpunk like this. It doesn't feel great, although you can see there are some high graphic settings happening here. And now that I've quit Cyberpunk, it, it's just crashed. After that crash, I decided to make a new account so I could try out the free tier. Ooh, now that we're in the peasant tier, we've got a queue for some beats, that's exciting. Luckily, despite a bunch of eager gamers ahead of us, the queuing just took about three minutes. We have taken a pretty significant drop from everything pretty much in ultra down to medium settings. So let's see how much different that looks. Visually, you could tell that it looked maybe a bit worse than the paid tier, but because of the small screen, you really had to look out for it. More importantly, to me, the latency felt pretty much the same as the paid tier. The same goes for Cyberpunk. The Beats mode offers a very similar experience to the paid tier. I then decided to try a game that in my experience works really well with cloud gaming. Fortnite. Fortnite has this weird way of being surprisingly playable with cloud gaming. And it looks good. This is better settings than I normally use on a PC, because I usually just turn everything to low with epic draw distance. Input latency, it's not not there, uh, but I think if you're just doing some casual Fortnite gameplay, it's fine. Visually, the priority tier looks better and does run at a higher frame rate, but depending on the context, it's difficult to tell. The most important thing is that they feel very similar when it comes to things like input latency. A big disadvantage of the free tier is the hour-long session length, and if that hour runs out mid-Fortnite session, you're gonna get kicked, which is pretty savage. But you can start as many sessions as you want a day, you just need to queue between them. So if you time your sessions right, you likely won't ever have your session axed right before a big win or whatever. And with that, I decided to try out some Xbox game streaming. The Xbox cloud gaming was way easier to get running than GeForce Now. I just logged in, clicked on a game, and it worked. So interestingly, with the Xbox live streaming service, 
you get a much more console-like gaming experience because your graphics are just quality or performance like that. But then when I realized I had to start a fresh Forza account, which involved a two-hour intro cinematic before I could do anything, I decided to launch Fortnite instead. Uh, straight off the bat, it already looks a lot blurrier than GeForce now. But the moment I started playing, I realized it was blurrier for a reason. Whoa, that feels way snappier than GeForce now. Xbox has clearly prioritized input latency over visual fidelity, which makes sense to me. I think that's a worthwhile trade-off. It does have a little bit of a heavy DLSS vibe with some grandma's dial-up connection, YouTube video compression going on here, but it feels really good. And graphics settings wise, I'd say it's similar to the paid tier of GeForce Now. Game library wise, it's all of the Xbox Game Pass stuff, uh, which is pretty extensive and it's included in the subscription. I then tried and failed to get PlayStation's cloud gaming running. The best I could get running was some abominable form of PS Link, which didn't recognize the controllers in the Logitech cloud, forcing me to use a touch control interface from hell. Gran Turismo 7 was completely unplayable because of the lack of variability in any of the controls, and it required me to have a PS5 running. So I swiftly moved over to a virtual computer cloud gaming service, Shadow PC, which went very well. Wait, you have to use the touchscreen like a trackpad? It doesn't... What? It carries over to the keyboard as well. You have to like move the mouse... What? I quickly realized that this was not the correct device to use the streaming service on, so I tried a Chromebook instead. I'm excited to see how this super cheap Chromebook handles Shadow. A few moments later. It's like the two mice are fighting each other. What is happening? The moment I brought the mouse settings up in Windows, the phantom mouse pointer disappeared, leaving a different problem in its wake. Whoa, that is an absurd amount of latency and desync. The mouse pointer has a mind of its own. And it wasn't just on the desktop where my mouse pointer felt like it was being routed via Uzbekistan. Gaming was equally uncomfortable. Not only is the frame rate terrible considering that we're running at 720p with Fidelity FX on, it's got some real issues tracking mouse movement. It feels so desynky in a way I've never experienced before. This is weird. I then decided to give it the best possible chance of success by running it on a gaming system with a 3700K and a 4090 in it. Wait, it didn't do any of these checks on the previous systems. This app is completely different on the desktop. Okay, well the weird mouse desync latency is gone, so that's good. But once I launched Dota, the word good quickly melted from my vocabulary. And what makes these dips down to 20 frames per second even more shocking is that this is by far the most expensive service I've tested so far. This costs $44 a month. I feel like for $44 you can buy an actual PC that will run Dota better than this. Now in all fairness to Shadow PC, I think it's mainly an enterprise product with some gaming marketing stapled on as an afterthought. At least I hope that's the case because wow do you have to pay a lot of money for the worst service in the lineup. Now aside from that, I spent a lot Lot of time cloud gaming this week on a whole bunch of different configurations using different services and I kept reaching the same conclusion. Cloud gaming shouldn't be seen as a replacement for physical hardware, it's just a way to get longer legs out of potatoes you happen to have lying around. The moment that you're spending $400 for a lobotomized Steam Deck, you're doing it wrong. The same goes for the cloud gaming services. The moment that they try and charge you a bunch of money for the services, don't do it. It's not worth it in my opinion, especially considering how unreliable they were and you still need to buy your own games with a lot of them. That's why I really like the free tier of GeForce Now. The hour long session limit combined with the queuing for beats is a bit of a pain in the butt and you get better performance going up the tiers, but latency wise they feel very similar and it can get expensive quite quickly. If you already use your Xbox Game Pass a lot then yeah, give it a try. Although bear in mind, it is in beta, the quality is a little bit iffy, and I did lose access to it after that first day of using it. On a final note, I did also try one of these little like controller add-ons for your phone with cloud gaming, which worked really well, even if it was a bit flimsy. I also bought a cheaper one, which was a complete disaster. It was wireless and added its own latency on top of the latency that was already there. So that was basically unusable. But this one with a physical connector worked really well. And if anything, with my phone in here, it gave a better gaming experience than the Logitech Cloud. 
and I already had the phone. And with that, let me know in the comment section down below what experiences you've had with cloud gaming. If you liked the video, subscribe to the channel, maybe watch another one, a suggestion will pop up in a second. And until the next video, bye-bye. Thank you.